Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today we have Jay Jacobs from BlackRock on the show. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Clay. Now you are an expert when it comes to thematics, active equity ETFs, and overall just kind of what's going on in the economy. And I'm really interested to get your thoughts on some of um, the items we're going to discuss today related to thematics and a couple specific trends. Let's start out by just having you talk about what thematics really are and why they're a focus at your firm. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, it's wonderful to be on the show. Um, you know, I've been focused on thematic investing for, you know, about 10 years now, uh, even though it seems like it might be kind of a newer style of investing. Really, the idea is how do we capture long-term structural trends uh, in our portfolios? So if we think about investors across the spectrum, a lot of us are looking to grow our capital. We want to invest today so that we have more money 10, 20 years from now. And at the same time, we understand that we're in a very changing world. So what worked in the past maybe doesn't work so much in the future. How do we anticipate what that future looks like and get out ahead of it with, uh, with thematic investing? So we look across the world at technology trends, at trends that are impacting people and demographics, that are impacting climate, things like urbanization or rising global wealth. We actually call all of those our five mega trends and look for opportunities within them to capture these long-term structural themes as they're emerging. So it's a little bit of um, mixing kind of a bit of futurism and anticipating the future with uh, you know, investment theory and understanding how this hasn't been priced into the market yet and where the opportunity is. Yeah, when it comes to thematics, I think of you know these very volatile funds that um, you know might have these hype cycles and have these up and down, um, just kind of a roller coaster ride. As many of them are higher beta, and you know these companies that are investing for the really long term. So I think it's really important when it comes to thematics that investors really understand the risk associated with such a trend and be really familiar with the trend overall. And then again, just having that really long-term time horizon. So I'm excited to dive into these a little bit deeper. Absolutely. And look, I'll agree with you that thematic investing when done well often results in concentrated portfolios. And that's actually the idea is if we're looking at a long-term structural theme, like uh, the investment and, and reinvestment in American infrastructure, you don't want a 300 stock portfolio because the third, the 300th stock that's added to that portfolio is probably not going to have a lot of exposure to that theme. You want to get really laser targeted on which companies benefit from the materialization of that theme. But naturally, that results in a more concentrated portfolio than something like a core broad-based index, and that will create more volatility. So a lot of this is not only capturing the growth opportunity, but also thinking about how does this fit in the portfolio? How do I diversify across themes? Because these can be more volatile. So making sure that we have diversification to spread out that risk and thinking about things like entry and exit points. When is the right time to get in? And when has the theme fully played out? And maybe we should be looking to what's next over the next 10 years. Oftentimes, the goal with investing is to achieve high risk-adjusted returns. That's kind of the end goal and what investors are really trying to do. Most people are comfortable just buying and holding a simple S&P 500. You know, it's kind of a go-to strategy, tried and true. Um, it'll get you, say, a 6 to 10% return over the long run. But when looking at thematics specifically, if the, trans if the trend ends up being huge, then you know, you could outperform that potentially given that you're right on your thesis. And you, like you mentioned, have the, um, a good entry point essentially. And in, in investing in a thematic ETF, you're ensuring that you're likely grabbing a lot of the winners in that trend, but you're also holding on to the losers. So how do you think about, um, you know, taking this basket approach of kind of buying the whole sector and buying some of the, um, those leaders and, you know, potentially buying losers as well in that, um, you know, that ETF versus just buying maybe one, two or three of the current leaders today? That's a great question. So first of all, if we think about the S&P 500 and investing in a fund like that, you have the same dynamic playing out. You're not betting that all 500 stocks are going to go up. 
you're expecting that over time, on average, those stocks will be rising and carrying the performance of that fund, but recognizing that some some company, I, I will make a grand statement, some companies in the S&P 500 today will not be here 10 years from now, but it's okay to hold them in a, in a fund like that because you're diversified. And I think the same principle uh, applies to thematic investing, that predicting the individual winners today for a theme that is still very early, that may take 10 years to fully play out, is a difficult job. Uh, and we want to play really many stocks in that ecosystem because, first of all, there's many parts of the ecosystem that might benefit. So if we're talking about infrastructure, we're not just saying that only electric utilities might do well. There's construction engineering companies that might do well. There's materials and commodities companies that might do well. There's transportation companies that might do well. So really thinking through the entire ecosystem of a theme of who benefits from this long-term structural theme, and then having diversification within those segments, because maybe you know we pick an area and there's there is a winner and there is a loser, but making sure we have, you know, exposure to more winners than losers over time. You know, if we, if we go back and think about a theme that's, you know, more mature, let's think about e-commerce. You know, e-commerce has now been around for 20 plus years. Uh, if you invested in it 20 years ago, there was risk, there was volatility. We, you know, there was a first wave of e-commerce companies that did not do particularly well. And there was a shakeout. And we saw some of those companies disappear. And we saw some of those companies be the biggest, most powerful companies in the world today. So the, uh, to, to answer your question, first, we need to have exposure to the ecosystem that will benefit. And we have to design our fund so that when there are winners, that we continue to capture those winners and cut our losers. So one of the things that we do, Clay, in, in, in some of our funds where we see um, a lot of economies of scale playing out, where meaning that one or two or maybe three winners are going to be the major winners in that specific theme, is we market cap weight that, uh, that fund. So we get more exposure to the winners. And if a company is not surviving and is going bankrupt, we're letting that exposure fall. And that's part of the product design and part of the thematic ethos of how do we capture the winners and ride those winners while cutting bait if something isn't making it. That's interesting. And when I was digging into your team's work, you mentioned that you know millennials are going to be a big driver of some of these mega trends going forward. And your team mentioned that millennials today account for 50% of global spending, which is kind of mind blowing for just one generation. And then I think about how millennials have, you know, higher debt levels, rising costs of education, housing, they're paying off their debts on those. And then you have the baby boomer generation retiring, which puts enormous pressures on just the labor market overall. Talk about how these, you know, demographic trends might affect the global economy. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the broader discussion is, yes, we have U.S. millennials, and U.S. millennials are kind of a very specific category of millennials, but we also have the global millennial. We have the rising consumer class, which is happening in emerging markets around the world, in LATAM and Africa and Southeast Asia, that are getting increasing consumer power. Actually, over 50% of retail spending now is happening uh, with emerging market consumers. So if we think about what worked in the past, what did people buy 20 and 30 years ago? Those are not the major consumers of the world today. It's the millennials in the United States who now are entering prime earnings years, who maybe even are inheriting money if they're lucky, um, and and you know doing family formation, which tends to be more of a uh, of a consumerism uh, part of one's uh, life cycle. Combined with that emerging market consumer, which is increasingly entering the middle class as emerging markets continue to see rising incomes, and you have to think, what are the companies that are selling to that consumer? Not yesterday's consumer, but today's and tomorrow's consumer. And what's interesting about that is that these consumers behave differently. So if you look at previous generations, frankly, there was more focus on materialism. People cared more about um, you know, buying jewelry and buying cars and buying homes. When you look at the millennial generation, there's more of an emphasis on experiences. Um, there's more of an emphasis on sustainability. If you look at how people make uh, purchasing decisions at a grocery store, millennials are much more likely to consider where that food comes from. So companies that are able to offer that product or offer that service to appeal to uh, the new consumer, we think is really set up for long-term growth rather than companies that are really resting on what worked in the past. So when we think about it, there's the thematic opportunity, which is what are those targeted companies that really understand the new consumer? But to your question, there's macro questions as well. Um, you know, what does this mean for housing when you have more family formation in, in millennials in the United States? Uh, what does this mean for food production? 
if we have a, a population that's going to reach 10 billion people by 2060, and we're going to have hundreds of millions of people in the emerging markets entering the middle class. And yet at the same time, we're kind of land constrained with how much food we can produce and general uh, productive agricultural land is actually shrinking in the world. Then how do we meet that supply and demand equation? Um, so I think uh, the, the generational shifts that we're seeing both in the United States and abroad are creating really fascinating questions that have many macro implications, but many thematic implications as well. Another piece related to what you're saying with millennials is that, you know, they're almost a different, you know, employee type as well. Some of these traditional companies that have been around forever that, you know, might not innovate as quickly as some of these, you know, emerging startups, you know, they might not, the incumbents might not be able to attract some of this millennial workforce because of, you know, the type of work environment they have, or, you know, maybe the flexibility and working from home and such. And I think that, you know, could disrupt a lot of the incumbents as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, there's uh, there's a lot of levels to determining this new consumer or this new cohort within the economy. One is how they spend their money. One is how they invest their money. And actually, we see a lot of millennials like looking at thematic investing because millennials have long-term time horizons. So they're investing for 20 years from now, not for five years from now. If you're a baby boomer and you're thinking about retirement, what's happening in the fixed income market today is a much more relevant conversation than a millennial who's thinking about how do I retire when I turn 65? So um, how millennials invest their money and how millennials spend their time, which is both leisure and work. So I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of effort to appeal to the psyche of millennials Again, not just in the United States, but globally as well. And I think companies that can really tap into that, the uniqueness of this generation, are going to see success both on the revenue side of their business as well as on the execution side of their business with hiring. What trends are you guys seeing that will benefit the most from, you know, the rise of the millennial being, you know, a large spender in the economy and then, you know, eventually the emergence of Gen Z in the workplace as well? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few different themes. Um, you know, we mentioned one of them already, which is looking at emergent and sustainable food. So if millennials are buying food differently, if they care more about organic food or where food is coming from, if it's grown locally or produced locally or how it's packaged, then we believe that a lot of companies that can appeal to that uh, millennial generation with the types of food they're producing are likely to be set up for the future. Um but also just a, being able to feed the millennial generation and that rising middle class that's abroad, uh, thinking through ag tech companies that are able to scale agriculture, uh, do agriculture indoors, do it in abandoned warehouses, do it on rooftops, uh, using less inputs like less water or less chemicals. Um, we believe those companies are going to be very well set up for feeding the next generation going forward. So we certainly have our eye on emergent food. Uh, also, when we think within financial services, we've seen that millennials are much more likely than baby boomers to be thinking about blockchain and thinking about decentralized finance and alternative finance. So uh, companies that can appeal to millennials uh, through those products and services, I think, are going to be well uh, positioned as well. Especially when we think about emerging markets, there's over 2 billion people that are unbanked. So who is able to use technology to reach that millennial investor overseas who maybe is only investing, you know, tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars and scaling that technology to them. I think they're well positioned as well. You know, there's this term mega trends that's being thrown around and, you know, in my mind, I think, okay, it's just a huge growth opportunity. And, you know, with that comes a huge investment opportunity. Maybe could you define what, you know, qualifies as a mega trend in the research you guys are doing? Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at a megatrend, we're really trying to understand what are the most powerful forces in the world today that are reshaping the global economy or society. So that sounds like a really big statement, but the reality is we can look at a lot of these different uh, aspects and kind of tease out the importance uh, to our economy. So if we think about one of our megatrends is breakthrough technologies. Often when a breakthrough technology is being produced, we can look at the total addressable market we're trying, where we are basically trying to anticipate how big is the market for this technology if and when it reaches entire scale. So an example of this is if we look at electric vehicles, uh, the total addressable market for electric vehicles is actually pretty simple because about 90 million cars are produced a year. All of those cars could be electric. 
that's the total addressable market today. Now, yes, the total cars being sold is probably going to increase over the next 10 years. Again, back to the emerging market consumer, more emerging market consumers are going to buy cars going forward. But let's ballpark that total addressable market as 90 million to 100 million cars being sold a year. You can put an average purchase price on those cars, probably around $25,000. Boom, you have your total addressable market. And then the question we ask ourselves today is, how much of that addressable market has already been penetrated? So if we're selling 9 million electric cars a year, we have about 10% penetration of that total addressable market. That means 90% of the market today, actually more than 90% of the electric vehicle market today, still has not been addressed with this technology. And then the question after that is, what is the investment opportunity and has it been priced in? So when we think about these themes, what often happens is the markets are short-term, uh, short-sighted, term short that they're not thinking 10 or 20 years from now, and they haven't fully priced in the power and the impact and the duration of these themes which creates an opportunity, a long-term opportunity, in, even in a disruptive uh, tech sector like electric vehicles. And also the markets tend to be a little bit uh, narrowly focused. So I'm sure all of us can probably name two or three electric vehicle stocks that are on the news, in the news every single day. But do we know about the lithium mining companies that are mining the lithium that goes into electric batteries? Do we know the battery producers that are predominantly based out of Asia that are producing those batteries? Do we know those parts suppliers that are creating electric engines specifically for electric vehicles or the infrastructure companies building electric charging? There's a huge ecosystem of companies that are playing a major role in electric vehicles that frankly are kind of undercovered and underappreciated by the average investor because they don't have the brand name. They don't have the, uh, let's, uh, let's call it uh, the charisma of a CEO. Uh, and maybe they're overseas and you know they, they're not publishing SEC reports because they're based out of another country and have their own regulatory regime. So even in these instances of a theme that we all know very well, and we see in our everyday lives, there's still opportunity in these themes. So a lot of that work in developing megatrends is quantitative work in understanding what is the size of the opportunity how much of that opportunity has already been addressed? And what does that mean for investors going forward? One of the mega trends you're bullish on or you've done research on is infrastructure specifically. Talk to us about what you're seeing in this field, infrastructure, and what it means going forward and how investors should think about this trend. Absolutely. So this is a theme that I've been excited about for several years now. And um, it's because, uh, again, if we look at some of the quantitative aspects of infrastructure, um, there's a little bit of a golden rule. Um, it's a little bit of a simplification, but generally you want to see a developed market economy like the United States spending about 2% of its GDP on infrastructure a year. That's kind of the maintain your infrastructure at a quality level and make sure it's growing to address, you know, kind of your growing population and, and changing dynamics within that population. There's really been only about two distinct periods uh, in the last century uh, where the United States has invested that much in, in infrastructure. It was in the 1930s during the Great Depression, and it was in the 1960s, 1950s and 1960s following World War II. Since then, we've basically left infrastructure to, um, to deteriorate. And we see that because the American Society of Civil Engineers put out, puts out a report every four years, and they gave infrastructure a D-plus grade uh, for the quality across the United States. So there's no way to avoid this. The infrastructure in the U.S. is not in good state. And we knew, you know, several years ago, thinking back, you know, looking at this theme, that it's too critical of an area not to receive more investment, that at some point, regardless of what's happening in Washington, we would see enough willpower uh, and enough political will uh, to ultimately bring forth a major, um, a major bill. And of course, we saw that last year. We saw the passage of the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, which is a $1.2 trillion bill. And I, frankly, if you ask me, that's a good amount of money. That's not everything that was needed to repair U.S. infrastructure. But it'll really restart the rebuilding and revitalization of things like airports, seaports, where we've seen huge constraints during uh, supply chain disruptions during COVID-19, uh, surface transportation, do we have enough lanes on highways? Are we fixing potholes? Do, are we making sure bridges are safe enough? Even thinking about things like water infrastructure, which maybe we take for granted, but a lot of uh, water infrastructure is leaking, which is wasting water, or it's still lead pipes, which can lead to really harmful uh, impacts on humans. And really, and, uh, as well as thinking about electric infrastructure, as we move towards more decentralized electrification, where people are putting solar panels on their roofs and windmills and, you know, in farms and things like that, uh, but really adapting that infrastructure for, for the new century. 
So we think that there's a really exciting growth opportunity within infrastructure, which is rare uh, over the last century. Um, but also there's kind of more of a near-term dynamic with infrastructure as well, which is that when we think about different asset classes that tend to do well in an inflationary environment, infrastructure is one of them. Uh, if you think about um, you know, the rates you might pay on your electricity or the rates you pay, at, pay on water, oftentimes those rates are written into law that that is going to be tied to, inf- uh, to inflation. So when inflation rises, the water company gets to raise your rates and the electric company gets to raise your rates and maybe even the bridge you cross to get to work raises its toll. That gives those companies inflation protection that even if inflation rises, they're going to continue to maintain that revenue. Um, so it tends to be a, a bit of an inflation fighting theme. And then on top of that, it tends to be a defensive theme that even in an environment like today where people are more concerned about recession and maybe we have slowing economic growth, people are probably not going to turn off the lights. They're probably not going to stop drinking water. They probably still have to go to work and, and pay those tolls, which gives it a very defensive characteristic compared to other segments of the economy, which are more cyclical. So we like infrastructure for that long-term growth thesis, but also given the context of the macro environment today. When I was doing research on this trend, I think it does make sense. And I was actually reading our TIP daily newsletter this morning that we send out to the audience. And it mentioned that Howard Marks and Oak Tree is actually bullish on infrastructure because of the many things you just mentioned. And then there's other pieces such as supply chain issues that need, you know, fixed and then the build out of infrastructure for green energy. And it's interesting to think about how how wide this, you know, trend goes. You have bridges, roads, airports, housing, schools. What, are there any specific sectors you think will play the biggest part of this or is it just kind of a diversified kind of mega trend? Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. It was roasted right here in the US in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP, or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. I would say this is a very diversified megatrend, and we've seen that in the passage of the IIJA, which addressed many of these different segments. If you, the definition of infrastructure is sweeping, and it's because really what are the things that we depend on as the backbone of our economy every single day to get to our jobs, to get goods and services to where we want to consume them, to travel around the country? And so there are a lot of different segments within infrastructure, um, and there's different drivers within each of those segments. So, you know, we were mentioning one of them, elect- uh, electric distribution. Um, on one hand, we just we absolutely need electricity. There's no question about that. We need a, an electrical grid that works. But at the same time, we're upgrading that electrical grid because it used to be just you had one local power plant and it spread its electricity across the grid and you turned on the lights and you turned on the AC and that was that. But now we have that decentralized electrical grid where 
Someone might have a solar panel on their roof. A farm might have a windmill in the middle of the farm. Uh, we're going to be charging cars, uh, you know, not just at our houses or at our offices, but anywhere along that grid. And that actually creates a lot of stress on uh, existing electrical grids. So how do we not only invest in infrastructure to make sure it works today, but also future-proof that infrastructure. So I think when we think about infrastructure, there's kind of that core infrastructure that it just has to turn on today, but there's also that new infrastructure that has to adapt to new technologies of the future. And I think that new infrastructure is where there's that additional layer of growth opportunity, because in a lot of ways, it just has to be completely built from scratch. On top of that, there's also the infrastructure enablers, as well as the owners, can you talk about, you know, what the difference between these two is and why an investor would, would want to own one versus the other? Absolutely. So, you know, digging into thematic investing again, it's not just looking at one sector or one asset class and trying to determine who wins. It's really thinking through the entire ecosystem. So the easy thing to think about with infrastructure is if we have better infrastructure, that's good for the electric company. That's good for the water company. Those are infrastructure owners, though. They already have infrastructure. When I was talking about kind of the new infrastructure, it's who are the companies that are going to be building that infrastructure going forward? That can be construction engineering companies that specialize in handling large scale construction. Uh, it can be machinery companies. If we have to, if we're building new airports, new terminals, or, or um, uh, new hospitals and schools, who are the companies that, uh, that build the machines that do that? Um, also, you know, thinking through totally from the upstream perspective, if we're rebuilding infrastructure across the country, that's going to put a lot of demand on steel, on cement, on asphalt, on, on other materials like copper. So we're really rethinking the entire ecosystem of infrastructure with those enablers being the inputs that go into new infrastructure. So let's think about existing infrastructure assets, those owners as kind of being uh, more like utilities companies. The enablers are more like industrials and materials companies that are going to be building the next generation. And when we think about this from a thematic perspective, we really like to combine those two groups because we want those builders and we want those operators to own the entire ecosystem. And it gives us more diversification within that theme. Actually, right now, when we see a more volatile market, those infrastructure owners are kind of acting as stabilizers because they tend to be more defensive, like we're talking about. They don't, you, know, you don't shut off the water, you don't shut off the lights in a recession the enablers are going to be a little bit more economically sensitive because maybe people do pull back on construction, but also they could benefit to the upside if we see more, as we're seeing more spending from the IIJA. So it's really combining these different pieces into the thematic fund um, that gets us very excited and is that thematic approach that is different from sector-based investing. You mentioned the infrastructure bill passed by the federal government and you know, it almost seems like this mega trend is very dependent on, you know, what sort of funding comes from the governments, whether it be the U.S. or other nations. How do you expect this to play out over the next decade? You mentioned how, you know, this investment is practically inevitable, but what do you think about, you know, the role that government plays and how this all pans out? It's a big role. And specifically in the United States, the government plays a disproportionately large role in infrastructure. We don't have a ton of privatized infrastructure, actually. When you go overseas to places like Europe or or, um, or in Asia, uh, sometimes the airports are publicly traded companies. And sometimes, uh, you know, seaports and railroads are more often actually publicly traded companies uh, rather than government entities. But in the United States, a lot of our roads and highways and these infrastructure assets are run by the governments themselves. So yes, the federal government plays an enormous role in this. I would say state and local governments also play a major role. We see very large, ambitious um, infrastructure uh, bills and infrastructure efforts still done at the state and local level. But there is room for private as well. Uh, a lot of, um, you know, let's, let's think about internet broadband companies. It's a form of infrastructure that's bringing internet and, and digital connectivity around the, uh, around the country. Those are private companies. And maybe you see more private investment in that space as we see efforts to expand broadband to rural areas. Um, so there are many layers to this theme beyond just the federal government. But certainly in the United States, the federal government does play an outsized role in this theme. Let's transition to talk about maybe a little bit more exciting uh, mega trend. I think of infrastructure kind of as you know, more of a foundational piece of a portfolio in terms of, you know, it's going to, you know, 
at least produce some cash flows during a recession or a downturn. And well, I, I think that's exciting, Clay, but I'll let you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just giving my perspective. Um, let's, let's transition to talk just about a different mega trend, robotics and artificial intelligence. You know, obviously this is something, you know, we've seen over the past, say, 20, 30 years. Why do you think this is a good opportunity now specifically? Yeah, so it's really interesting. You know, robots have been around for a surprisingly long time. Uh, you know, you can see references to robots dating back to the early 1900s. Uh, you know, you can think about Jetsons cartoons or, you know, a, a Space Odyssey 2001. Maybe maybe the millennial audience hasn't seen that one. But the, uh, robots have been around in popular culture for a very long time. And even they've been around in the economy for a long time. The first robots were really introduced in an industrial capacity in the 1970s in Japan, in the auto manufacturing segment, where these were really big, clunky robots that picked up pieces of sheet metal and put them down somewhere else. They weren't smart. They weren't nimble. They weren't thoughtful. They weren't considering their environment. They were programmed to do one thing and be basically be a tool uh, that humans could use to do the stuff that humans were incapable or unwilling to do. Now, if we fast forward today, robots are, of course, much smarter and much more capable than ever before. So robots can be super fast. They can be extremely precise. We're seeing robots being uh, used to do surgery on people's hips and people's knees and people's backs. Uh, we're seeing robots that have the, uh, the dexterity and the agility to pick up gentle fruit like strawberries and not crush them. Uh, and of course, we're seeing, you know, continued use in technology spaces where they're being used to manufacture, you know, just completely microscopic chips in, in the semiconductor space. So the amount of use cases that are emerging in the robotic space are really growing with that capability um, as that capability and technology gets better and better. Uniquely in this environment, though, we're seeing many drivers that are making robotics, robotics adopted even faster. So one thing is just the economics of robotics. Technology tends to get cheaper over time. Labor costs tend to rise. So when that pattern continues to compound year after year, you see that robots tend to get cheaper and hiring a manufacturing worker to do the same job is getting more expensive. And oftentimes that that those paths are now crossing where the payback period for certain robots is now two or three years, meaning you turn on that robot, it works 24 hours a day, seven hours a week, 365 a year, doesn't take breaks, doesn't take you know vacation or anything like that. And in about two or three years, that robot will have paid for itself versus an equivalent worker. So the economics are driving robotics adoption. But also what we're seeing is labor is now increasing. We're seeing you know, uh, inflation and in wages, which is making it even more expensive relative to robots. And we're also seeing supply chain disruptions where previously the answer to rising labor costs for certain companies was, let's move that manufacturing overseas. Let's go to somewhere where labor is really cheap. But now, given that we have disrupted supply chains and COVID really showed how much regional dependence some of these companies might have, a lot of these companies are rethinking manufacturing and their supply chains and saying, we want to build stuff in the United States or we want to build stuff in Europe. We don't trust the globally integrated supply chain anymore. But the, the, the way to do that in an economic way is to use robotics as much as possible because moving that manufacturing to the U.S. is going to be more expensive from a labor perspective is to try to automate as much of those functions as possible. So in 2021, we saw record sales for robotics um, because of that. A lot of companies preparing to move manufacturing to the United States and automate as much as possible. And we're continuing to see that trajectory going forward. In fact, I think what's kind of interesting about robots is um, if we uh, if we think about kind of what is slowing robotic adoption, why is robotic adoption not even faster in a place like the United States? It's not that we can't get our hands on enough robots. It's that we don't have enough engineers who are trained in robots to say, okay, we have a robot on a desk. How do we train it to now you know build a semiconductor? So there's actually an education process in the United States where we have to develop the next generation of engineers to use these new tools. You know, I was looking at Ticker IRBO, iShares Robotics and Artificial Intelligence ETF. I see 115 holdings in this fund. And I'm when I'm looking at the holdings, I see many of the big tech companies. I see some companies out of China. So for the US, Microsoft, Google, Twitter, and then China, you have JD, Baidu, Alibaba. I'm curious, you know, how companies, you know, qualify to enter your fund and how 
maybe investors should think about it and how it might be different than say something like the NASDAQ? Yeah. So this is a very broad theme because we see so many companies involved in robotics and or artificial intelligence. So I think of robots as the body and artificial intelligence as the mind. They have an eye on uh, how do we automate, how do we leverage our data, how do we leverage our processing power to generate insights? And maybe that's as simple as suggesting the next website you should go to, or as simple as suggesting the next song or the next movie that you listen to or watch. But artificial intelligence is becoming ingrained in their product, and in many ways is the key to their success. If they were recommending bad songs, you'd maybe stop listening to, you know, to that service. So artificial intelligence in many ways has just become the next age of technology as we aggregate more data and get more processing power. A lot of companies that maybe were kind of simple web companies or simple product companies are now becoming AI companies. And that's being equally felt in the United States as well as overseas in places like China. Um, you know, to answer your question, how does this differ from other indexes? Well, part of it is that global reach that when we think about the rise of robotics and artificial intelligence, some of the leading robotics companies in the world are Japanese. And frankly, a lot of these companies, I'm, uh, you know, the average investor probably has never heard of, but they are really good at making robotic arms that can move quickly and pick up things that are very small. A lot of artificial intelligence companies are overseas in China now. Um, a lot of robotics and AI companies are in Europe. So if you're just simply buying a, a broad market index, um, one, you might not be getting that global exposure, depending on which index you're buying, but the S&P 500, you're not getting global exposure. Um, and even if you are getting global exposure in a broad index, uh, we have a, a tool uh, called the um, called our X-ray tool, where we look at what is the thematic exposure within those broad indexes. And what we often find is there's very little exposure to these themes within those broad indexes. Maybe you're getting some of the mega cap companies, but looking at some of those small and mid cap companies that are leading in robotics and artificial intelligence, you're getting very minimal exposure through broad market indexes. Are there any specific industries you're seeing, you know, large impact in the robotics space? Absolutely. So, you know, the, the previous industries that really benefited from robotics were in manufacturing, you know, auto manufacturing makes a ton of sense. These are heavy things. They're, it's mostly kind of pre-programmed. You can program a robot to, you know, weld a, you know, a beam to a frame of a car or, to, you know, do these kind of uh, repeated tasks. But as robots get smarter and more capable, the question is, how do robots now get into other industries? So we're seeing robots being used in healthcare. Robots are doing surgeries right now. Um, robots are going to be doing cleaning uh, and delivery service. Um, robots are going to be uh, cre uh, you know, preparing food and delivering food to tables soon because the capabilities are getting better than ever before. So I think um, hospitality and services, I think hospitals and medicine are going to see more robotic penetration because it's cheaper because it's safer, because it's more repeatable, or because we're just going to continue to have labor shortages. You know, in a lot of ways, you know, people worry about robots taking, you know, jobs. Um, you know, if a robot is, is, uh, is cleaning a hospital, is that, you know, a job that a human would have been doing? But actually, if we fast forward, and this is always what we're doing in thematic investing, we're fasting forward uh, to 10 years, 20 years ahead, there's real challenges in the labor market in the healthcare space because there's going to be so many baby boomers that are reaching, you know, senior years and are going to need senior care. Frankly, that can't just be addressed with humans in the United States today. And this isn't just, you know, looking at a crystal ball. What we do is we look at parallels around the world. We're already seeing that in Japan today. And Japan is sort of ahead of the United States in that demographic curve where they have a very top heavy aging population. They already have issues with how do you care for that senior generation? And guess what? They're using robots. There's no mistake that the leading robotics companies in the world are often Japanese because they need to use them uh, at a societal and economic level to treat those, uh, you know, those issues. So that's coming our way in the United States. Um, and, you know, part of uh, part of it is still technological advancement. But interestingly, I think part of it is also society adapting to that, the concept that it's OK to, you know, have a, uh, a soda delivered to you by a robot rather than a human because, Ultimately, maybe that makes food less expensive or, you know, stretches our economy less than. I mentioned that, you know, this one robotics fund has just over 100 holdings. So that means each company is about a 1% allocation or less. I'm curious how you guys landed on, you know, that 1% or 115 companies number and, you know, how you determine how many companies should be held in a fund like this. <laughs> 
Absolutely. So this all comes into kind of the design of the theme where we do a lot of work before we launch a product to understand what is the theme? What are the segments that benefit? How do we identify those segments? Where do those segments come from? Is it specific sectors or, or um, you know, certain geographies? And then also, how do we weight those different companies? You know, is this a winner-take-all segment or is this going to be more spread out and diversified? And actually, what we've thought about within robotics is this is probably going to be more diversified winners. Like we don't see one robotics company taking over the entire world of robots. Um, oftentimes we see more specialization that one robotics company focuses on the medical space. One AI company focuses on media. Uh, one robotics company focuses on automation within uh, the automobile manufacturing space. So in this instance, as we think about this theme, we want to plant a lot of seeds across the world and across different sectors because this is a really broad theme that has a lot of potential winners in it. Unlike the example I used earlier, which was e-commerce, which there's a lot of economies of scale. And if you're looking at that from a thematic perspective, you might want to be pretty top heavy in just a few names that dominate e-commerce. One item, you know, we've talked about so much on this network is just the macro environment. So I'm curious to maybe hear your thoughts on what you're seeing as far as the macro environment and how that might affect some of these trends you're looking at. Well, probably the most important part of the macro environment that's on people's minds today is inflation, because we see it every time we go to the grocery store, we see how much more expensive things are getting. I still get floored sometimes when I see how expensive my shopping cart is or when I dine out and get the bill from the restaurant. And so we see it every day. But the question then is really kind of what are the themes that benefit from that? And I think we've talked about a few of those themes. We've talked about infrastructure being resilient to, um, to inflation because it automatically adjusts its prices. Um, we've talked a bit about food because food can naturally benefit as uh, the companies that are producing food or producing solutions to produce more food in the future benefit from rising inflation in, in the food space. Uh, even in some cases, it's clean energy. Uh, what, one of the metrics that people look at in clean energy is levelized cost of energy. And when oil prices are higher, the relatively fixed costs of something like a windmill or a solar uh, photovoltaic cell uh, become lower, um, relatively speaking, because you build a windmill once, that's most of the cost. But if you build a gas-fired plant, you're constantly buying gas, even as gas prices are rising or falling. So when gas prices are higher, that windmill or that solar plant looks more attractive. So from a lot of we're, we're um, you know, we're looking at inflation, but specifically we're thinking about what are some of the themes in the near term that have more of that inflation resilience. We still have the long term, you know, excitement around the theme, but we understand that investors care about the near term environment and are recognizing how that impacts these themes. Jay, what a informational conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to give you a chance to hand off to what you guys are working on at BlackRock, the research you're doing, and anything else you'd like to share before we close it out. I mean, all I'd share is that we are constantly thinking about these themes, we're researching these themes, and we're developing new ones. And as much as I want to tease the future, um, I'll have to wait a little bit on that, but I'll make a plug for at www.ishares.com slash megatrends. You can see our latest research. You can see our latest products because we are constantly, by definition, this space is evolving. We have to, too, with our research and with our product offering. So uh, advise uh, you know people to check out uh, ishares.com slash megatrends to keep up with the latest. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you, Clay. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.